Great, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me. Okay, I'm, my name is Lucy Gray, and I'm here with my co-chair, Steve Harkinon, to introduce our first keynote of the day. We are very honored and pleased to have Dr. Fernando Reimers with us today from Harvard, and he's been instrumental in the world of global education, and, and uh, we're really excited to have him share his work with us today. Um, he can tell you more about what he's been up to at Harvard and that sort of thing. I know that he did have a convening last spring around global education, so um, and, and among numerous uh, things. So we're really thrilled to have you, Dr. Rumors, and uh, we look forward to your talk. And if we can do anything to help you, just uh, let us know. We'll be moderating questions at the end, so if participants, if you have any questions, please um, let us know. Um, before we really begin, uh, we're going to go through, um, Steve, do we have our slides, our regular slides up here? There we go. Okay. So we'd like to give special thanks to our sponsors today, which are Iron USA, Brain Pop, Flat Classroom, Little Lives, Big Dreams, and Blackboard Collaborate, and TechSmith. Without them, this conference would not be possible. So thank you to our sponsors. Our next uh, task is to give everybody a little uh, orientation to where we're all coming from today is to do, um, to use the point, not the pointer tool, but the little uh, star tool um, on, the, on the left side of the whiteboard to indicate where you are in the world this morning or this afternoon or wherever you are. I'm in Chicago, Illinois. Ooh, we've got somebody pretty far away, a lot of U.S. people today. And also, if you'd like to indicate exactly where you are in the chat, you can type into the chat uh, your location. We've got somebody from The Hague, yay. So this is pretty exciting. Um, this session is going to be recorded, so if you have colleagues that were not able to attend, um, they will be able to uh, to see this at any time um, about a half an hour or so after the session is over. So without further ado, I'm going to um, uh, let Dr. Remers take over and uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Lucy and Steve, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And I can see that Ed Gregor has just joined us. Uh, Ed is a friend whose life work is also about global education. Indeed, I do convene a think tank every year. We'll uh, have another one this May on global education. And those of you who are interested can just Google my name, and you'll get to my website. And under future talks, you'll have information on that, uh, on that think tank. I wanted to share some ideas today about uh, a direction which I think we should try to uh, move education reform in this country and elsewhere, and hopefully leave some time for discussion within our half an hour. So I'm going to assume that those of us in, in the call are individuals who can lead efforts of educational improvement, either as teachers, school leaders, principals, district leaders, or people working with other organizations, nonprofit and otherwise, supporting schools, and therefore, within our own spheres of influence, I'm going to assume that we can all, uh, we can all impact the work of schools. So education, uh, sort of in a global context, is perhaps as old as the idea of education itself. The idea is only 400 years old, and it was John Amos Moravius, I'm sorry, John Amos Comenius, a Moravian uh, minister, who proposed that everyone should be educated so that we could have peace. But it was really on a global scale 60-some years ago with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when education uh, became a basic human right that the global architecture to advance that right was advanced. Uh, there was tremendous moral clarity, I think, in 1947 when the Declaration was passed on the fact that education had as a purpose uh, the, the goal of helping people to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, r racial or religious groups, and further the activities of the UN for the maintenance of peace. So uh, Section 2 of Article 26 of the Declaration clearly is proposing that the reason we want to give every 
child in the world the opportunity to be educated is so that they have some form of global competency that would contribute to peace. Now, I, I want to mention that uh, the world is changing at accelerating speed, at exponential speed. And one of the areas uh, in which it is changing, of course, is globalization. Through telecommunication technologies, through media, uh, through uh, migration, through travel, we are all uh, in, in very frequent contact with people from different civilizational streams. So globalization has arrived to every local site, every school that, uh, that we might imagine. And the question is, uh, what kind of competencies do students need to understand this phenomenon, to own this phenomenon, to turn it into a positive force? So I want to talk for a moment about uh, an approach to stimulate innovation called the X Prize. The X Prize was established, its foundation was established by a group of inventors and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley that has the form of a competition. So one of the first X Prizes invited teams to produce uh, designs for shuttles that could be launched into space for private travel. And about 40 different teams participated, and the winner received a financial reward. And there is now a private company producing a shuttle, which I think uh, any of us could travel in a very short time for the price of $200,000. And I understand that the expectations are that in a decade, it will be able to uh, circumnavigate Earth for a cost of about $20,000 per seat. Last year, the X Prize focused on stimulating uh, the development of a new technology to clean oil spills. And that technology, uh, the technology that had been used last year to clean the spill of the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico was the same one that had been used 20 years ago to clean the spill of the Exxon Valdez. So the X Prize invited uh, teams to participate in these, and about uh, 60 participants uh, join the competition. What is interesting about these competitions is that on average, the teams that have participated have 30 people. Now stop and think about that. 30 people can today do what in the past only very large organizations, government organizations like NASA, private organizations like IBM or GE could do. And I think this is uh, a very remarkable characteristic of the time in which we live. Now, why can small teams do that? A, because of the spread of knowledge, and B, because of technology, which allows people to collaborate across borders as we are doing this morning in, uh, in this conversation. So I think that's a very significant trend that educators need to take notice of, and I which leads to the question of how do we prepare students with the kinds of skills to form those teams so that they can address significant global challenges in an effective manner. And of course, that involves understanding what those challenges are, caring enough about them to want to do something about those challenges, and then having the skills, which include uh, in the subject matter skills to have deep knowledge of the different disciplines that inform the solution of those challenges, as well as the uh, intercultural skills, the soft skills, to be able to work with peers uh, all over the world uh, through technologies like the one we're using this morning to produce the designs to address those challenges. So I want to conclude just with uh, one example uh, of, of what globalization and, and the exponential change of technology makes possible. So around the world, I do a lot of work in Brazil, and Brazil has been radically transformed in the last 10 years in terms of access to mobile phones. Uh, less than 10 years ago, only one in five persons had access to a mobile phone. Uh, today, this is 2007, is more like 75% of the population, which is to say that three quarters of Brazilians today are better communicated with the rest of the world than the President of the United States, or the President of IBM for that matter, who was 20 years ago. Now, imagine the power that results of connecting this technological development with another technological development, supercomputing or cloud computing, Watson. So Watson can today perform certain tasks more accurately than humans. 
For example, medical diagnosis. There are people working, programming Watson so that they can perform medical diagnosis. And that's pretty important because in the United States, when you go to the doctor, you have a 50% chance that you're going to be misdiagnosed for some illnesses. And that's pretty high. That's why most people, uh, when they get a diagnosis that has high stakes attached to it, get a second opinion. It makes sense to get a second opinion with such a high error rate. Now, Watson beats those odds. Now imagine uh, the power that results from connecting this kind of capacity of a supercomputing with mobile phones. We basically are in a position to offer most people around the world better quality health diagnosis than most people in this country get when they go to the doctor. These are the kinds of technological breakthroughs, the kinds of inventions, the kinds of innovations that I think are going to help us uh, over the next decades address some of the most important global challenges in the world, whether those are the challenges of health, the challenges of uh, global climate change, energy challenges, political challenges, uh, challenges re related to resource scarcity, overpopulation, and so on. So the question is, uh, are schools preparing students to understand those challenges, to care enough about them, and to have the skills to make a meaningful difference in, in addressing them? So this is a picture that I want to use as an allegory. I'm going to, I'm going to use two pictures as allegories today. Uh, this is a picture of the Computer Science Building at Stanford University. And this building is called the William J. Gates Building. And I'm told the reason the, reason the building is called the William J. Uh, J. Gates Building is because Bill Gates gave the money to Stanford to build it. And I'm told that Bill Gates uh, only had one condition uh, for, this, uh, for this gift to the university, which was that they located this building in this particular site. The site is diagonally across from the place where this picture was taken, which is the math department at Stanford. And I'm told that the window from which this building is uh, perfectly viewable is the window of a math professor at Stanford who was a visiting professor at Harvard University when Bill Gates was a student. Now, when Bill Gates took that course uh, 30 some years ago, I'm told that he did very poorly. He obtained an F in that course. And that F weighed very heavily on, uh, on Mr. Gates' thinking uh, that summer to the point that he decided not to come back to the university. Now, I don't know whether this, true, this story is true or not. It's a good story. But if it is true, it suggests two very pow powerful things. One, that the F that Bill Gates obtained in that course had very little predictive value about the, his capacity uh, to really uh, make contributions to an entire industry, uh, to the economy in, the, in this world, to really transform in very important ways the, the way in which we do a lot of business, something as simple as, as writing uh, or communicating with other people. But the second thing that this tells us uh, the, the most powerful piece of the allegory is that in education sometimes the things that we value, the things we measure, have very limited relationship with what is truly important, with the kinds of long-term outcomes that we all care about when we are in the business of education, whether those are preparing people to be contributing members of the economy, of the society, of the communities of which they are part, to live fulfilling lives. Uh, so I want us to keep this allegory in mind because in the United States uh, we are at a time when the dominant approach to reform is one that basically says we should be very clear about what we're trying to produce, we should measure that, and then we should attach high stakes to what we're measuring. But of course we're largely measuring uh, cognitive skills. We're measuring uh, the ability to develop academic knowledge, not necessarily the ability to solve problems. Uh, we're not measuring what people call soft skills. Now, soft skills include things like greed, uh, the ability to resolve conflicts, the ability to persist, the ability to negotiate differences, the ability to communicate, the ability to work with others, uh, the emotional capacity to read uh, the effect on other people of our actions, and so on. And all those skills are very important uh, when you have to work with other people, particularly when you have to work uh, with other people uh, in, uh, in, around the world, uh, people who come from different cultural traditions and, and so on. So uh, this uh, cartoon 
here talks about the dominant approach to reform here, which is we are testing, we're testing, we're testing, but we may be testing the kinds of things that Bill Gates, professor at Harvard, uh, tested 30 some years ago. We may be testing things that are not really uh, very consequential in the long term. So this is the second allegory. Uh, this is the story of a graduate, of a college graduate many years ago, who obtained a job doing a study of the productivity of small farmers and cattle ranchers. And his job consisted basically of interviewing people like this shepherd and figuring out how they spent their time, how they went about their work, and then relating uh, what these people did and the productivity in their work with the education that they had. Now this graduate, as he's interviewing the shepherd, asks him, so how do you spend your time? And this person says, well, I basically have to take care of all these sheep. And how do you do that? Well, in the morning, I open the gates of the barn where the sheep spend the night, and I get them out so that they can graze, and I keep an eye on them, and I count them to make sure that uh, all my sheep are okay and healthy and moving about. And then midday, I help them move to a different section of the field so they graze in a different area. And I count them again, and mid-afternoon I count them again. So the graduate says, gee, it sounds to me like you spend an awful lot of time counting your sheep. He says, yeah, that's what I do. He says, well, how much time do you spend? He says, I, I don't know. I don't keep time. I don't have a watch. He says, you know that you, you had had the education that, uh, that I received. It would take you very little time to count your sheep. And then you would have all this free time. And the shepherd says, really? He says, yeah. The college graduate says, if I prove this to you, would you give me one of your sheep? And he says, sure. So the graduate estimates the area uh, in which these uh, sheep are grazing and the density, approximates the density, and he says, you have 374 sheep. And the shepherd says, yeah, that's very remarkable. So the graduate says, can I take my animal? He says, sure. So as the graduate is grabbing, is struggling to grab the animal, the shepherd says, oh, excuse me, sir. Yes, he says, now I know where you went to school. He says, really? He says, yeah. If I tell you where you went to school, you give me back one of your sheep? He says, sure. He says, you went to school in the best private college in the capital city uh, of the country, didn't you? He says, yes. How do you know? He says, because you're taking my, go my dog. Now, the point of his story uh, is that it is very hard to think about the quality of education if we do not also think about the context where students uh, are going to have to live and work. And as that context changes, as I have argued uh, it does as a result of global globalization, it is very, very important to re-examine our approaches to improve education systems to make sure that we are not producing people who cannot tell the difference between the sheep and the dogs that should matter with them, uh, that we're not really uh, focusing on the kinds of skills that have no predictive value over the long-term capacity of people to live fulfilling lives, to make meaningful contributions to their societies, to the communities of which they are part. So I want to make the case that given globalization and given some of the trends that I just outlined, it is very, very important that all schools help their students develop global skills. Now, the real question is not whether we want to teach global skills. I think most educators these day and age would say they're important. The real question is, how important do we think they are relative to the many other things that we also want to teach in schools? How do they relate to these other things? And uh, what are we willing to, how much are we willing to invest in developing them? So, uh, I want to focus the rest of this presentation in presenting, sharing some ideas on what we can do to promote global competency in the schools. Uh, I'm going to share with you information on what uh, school leaders uh, in this country say they, they do to promote global competency and about some of the constraints. And then I want to invite uh, your ideas on how do we move forward in this space. So, I say that we live at a time of a global education paradox, because most people you talk to would tell you uh, they recognize globalization. They would tell you that global education is important. But in fact, our schools and universities offer very limited opportunities to develop this kind of competency. And so the question is why? What are the bottlenecks? And what can we do about it? <laughs> 
So I, I talked to educators all over the country, in fact, in different countries about these issues, and occasionally I ask them uh, a few questions. So uh, these are the result of a survey that I gave a group of principals at one of the seminars we have here at Harvard on, on uh, leadership development. And I asked these principals, uh, to what extent do you agree with this statement? In my school, more should be done to develop global competency. And what you see here is that 8 out of 10 principles agree with that statement. In fact, almost 9 out of 10. So that suggests that this is a priority, at least for the principles who come to our training programs. But I don't think they are atypical. I think this is what most principles would tell you. They think they should do more. Now I ask them, in your school, do teachers agree on what it means to make a student globally competent? And this is the beginning of the problem, because you have almost a mirror image of the figure that shows that 90% of them strongly agree or agree with the fact that more should be done to develop global competency. With regards to whether there is agreement among their teachers on what global competency means, 68% say, no, most teachers don't agree. So there is, I think, a logical uh, inference we can draw from that, which is that the very first step that any school leader could take to get an organization, a school, or a district to move forward is to promote a conversation about what does it mean to be globally competent, is to get people to share their own definitions and develop a working agreement, a working consensus on, on what global competency is. Because until we do that, we're going to have, perhaps, individual efforts, individual champions in their classrooms doing a little bit of something here, a little bit of something there, but we aren't going to have a whole school approach, an integrated approach that has any kind of coherence that can produce any kind of synergy to help students develop global competency. So that's step one. Now, when the principals were asked, is the development of global competency a priority for your teachers? Again, Three quarters of them say no. Now that's interesting, and it's part of the paradox. Why do we have schools where the principals say that global competency is important to them, but it is not important to their teachers? And I want to suggest that there are two reasons for that, uh, perhaps three. One is that in a place where you have no coherence, the kinds of things that are going to take precedence are either the kinds of things we've been doing for a long time, or the kinds of things everybody agrees that we should be doing, and where there is enough of a consensus on how to do that. Literacy, getting the kids to do well on the state tests, on the standards, mathematics, uh, creativity even, problem solving. But global competency, where you have a lot of definitions, Yes, it may be important, but not the kind of thing that anyone can, can spend much intellectual capital on, because the truth is that our teachers are pretty stretched, are pretty busy uh, with a range of competing demands. So that's one reason. The second reason, of course, are these tests, uh, which may be measuring the, the wrong thing. They're not measuring global skills. And the third thing is that perhaps our teachers need some help to teach, global, to develop global competency. You know, if you talk about foreign languages, you don't improvise the capacity to teach foreign languages. If you talk about global climate change, again, you don't improvise that capacity. We need good curricula, good instructional materials, good resources, and good professional development to do that. And of course, in the United States, at least, we are living at a time of tremendous resource scarcity, where there are many districts making very, very hard choices about what to keep. This is not a context where there's a lot of uh, extra money left to develop the competencies and skills of teachers in new, in new areas. So these are my, my hypotheses about why this is not a priority in practice for teachers. And those are the kinds of things we're going to have to be imaginative about changing. Uh, when the principals are asked, are there sufficient opportunities for the students in your school to develop global competency, the result won't surprise any of you. Three, in f three out of four say, no, there aren't. Of course, if it's not a priority for teachers, and if there is no agreement on what it means, uh, it stands to reason that uh, the opportunities to develop those skills are really limited, are really deficient. Again, when principals were asked, is there good alignment between the way in which we are assessing student learning and the purpose of developing global competency, again, three out of four said no. 
there isn't good alignment uh, around that goal. When principals were asked, are there opportunities to develop global competency infused throughout the curriculum? Infusion is the dominant approach to global education in the United States. Uh, I'd like for us to spend some time in the discussion about whether this is the best approach. Uh, my own reading is that for very good teachers and for teams of teachers who know how to do interdisciplinary curriculum and project-based learning, Infusion can be a wonderful way to do that. But the bar in terms of teacher skills to do that is much higher than the kind of competency required for a teacher to teach their own subject in their classroom, whether this is uh, you know, economics or history or geography. So the fact that we do infusion when we may not have the teachers with the capacities to do interdisciplinary work very well is, uh, is problematic, I think. Now, finally, this is the same question, are there opportunities for students to develop global competency? Most of the teacher, most of the principals, almost half of them say not very much, and about 33% say not at all. So three more than three quarters of them say no, we're not really providing those opportunities. Are there opportunities to learn foreign languages? Notice the question, I didn't ask are there opportunities to develop global la uh, foreign languages at high levels uh, or to develop fluency just to learn them? And I think we do a little better here. There are opportunities. Uh, uh, one in three principals say yes to a great extent, and one in three say, I'm sorry, one in five say to some extent. So more than half of the principals say that there are opportunities to learn to speak a foreign language at least at the beginning level in their schools. Are there opportunities to participate in project-based learning around global topics? Now, I, I believe that project-based learning is a very powerful pedagogy that helps students uh, take what they know and put it at the service of solving real problems, uh, of understanding, of, of using it, developing the skills to apply that knowledge. Uh, very powerful pedagogy in terms of developing the skills to do, uh, skills as opposed to just knowledge. And about 46% of the principals say that there are such opportunities in their schools. Are there opportunities to travel abroad? For those of you who've traveled abroad, you know how powerful these experiences can be, at the very least, at the attitudinal, dispositional level, in terms of opening your mind, getting you to value cultural difference and so on. And really only one in five principles say that there are such opportunities. Are there opportunities for the teachers? Same story. Only 26% of the principals say that there are such opportunities. Are there opportunities for prof teacher professional development so they can be, the teachers can become more competent in global education? And again, only one in four of the teachers say that there are, of the principals say that such opportunities exist. Now, how do we develop those opportunities? Well, creating partnerships between schools and universities or not-for-profits or for-profit companies that have that mission. And again, those partnerships are very limited, are just as limited as the number of opportunities that exist. So, I'd like for you to think about, so what are the implications of these responses? Because it seems to me that in these responses lies the answer to the global education paradox, which is, as I argued earlier, that we say that global education is important, but in fact we do very little to develop the, that skill set and those capacities. Let me share a few more slides and then uh, open it up for, for discussion. This is a slide that may shock you because Global education is actually a very old aspiration. This person here was a professor at Teachers College, Columbia University, and in 1928, at a lecture that he gave to the Association of Secondary School Principals, he made the case for global education. He said it was extremely important. So the question is, you know, this is not a new discovery. We've been doing the, we've been trying to do global education for a hundred years. How come we're doing such a limited job at it? It seems to me that the next generation of changes of global education to address some of the shortcomings that I identified earlier, we're going to have to shift from individual changes, from the work that individual teachers do, in fact, in many of our schools, to truly institutional, integrated, coherent, and synergistic efforts. And that is going to require 
leadership, leadership of school leaders. We need to go from the initiatives of a few faculty members, a few teachers who are the champions, to developing a coherent vision at the school level, to building teacher capacity so we can grow the circle of people who can do this, to create the alignment between assessment, global education, and everything else that the school is trying to do, and especially with the school culture. We need to provide and identify adequate instructional materials. And I think we need to engage students as part of the enterprise and turn students into allies of a broad uh, global movement for global education reform. Now, the challenges to doing these uh, seven things is, first of all, we're going to have to balance the risk of superficial internationalization. I imagine many of you are familiar with these very famous uh, cultural festivals in schools where once a year parents are invited and students are invited to celebrate all the cultures in the school and they bring different ethnic foods and they have little stands and all that is good and wonderful but it really doesn't develop any kind of sustained engagement with global, uh, with global education, right? It may be a part of something bigger but if that's all the school does it isn't going to produce much global competency at the end. So what I think is depth and rigor and committing the resources, including teachers and the time, the most valuable resource we have in education, so that we can uh, provide our students with serious opportunities to develop global competency. We're also going to have to develop teacher capacity. There is no way around it. Now, maybe we can innovate uh, using the kinds of approaches that the X Prize demonstrates are possible. Perhaps it's possible for 30 people around the world using technology, uh, using tools like this conference to, on a sustained basis, develop this kind of capacity. But there is no way around the fact that uh, if we're going to have better global education, the teachers have to be part of the enterprise. They have to be on board. We're going to have to receive standards and assessment, because the truth is that these tools are very powerful. And if the standards and assessment do not measure anything that relates to global competency, uh, we can advocate for a law we want, we can develop capacity, but at the end, what we measure is what we count. I also think we need to do a little bit of advocacy, helping people move away from a zero-sum worldview of schools, uh, which dominates, especially at this time of financial recession, of economic recession, which leads some people to hunker down, to say, yeah, 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 that's important, but I don't even have money to do PD around literacy instruction. I think we're going to have to make the case that global education, in fact, is synergistic and can support the achievement of many other goals, the way in which the Partnership for 21st Century Skills has done, I think, very successfully. And then, of course, we need to consider parental values and, and expectations. So the key components, I'm arguing then, for the development of a school level if not district level, strategy for internationalization. And a strategy needs to be clear about the purpose. That means it needs to define what we need by international global education, why do we want to do it, what are the outcomes that we should produce, uh, how are we going to produce it, and what process. We need to map the process, the sequence, that is going to help every school go from wherever they are at the moment to an end state where they, the opportunities for global education are just much more pervasive. Now, what are some of the strategies that schools can do to produce whole school globalization? Well, one is to internationalize the curriculum. This has been done successfully at the higher education level and, and for some schools. The other one is to internationalize the faculty. Now, this is more prevalent at the higher education level than at the uh, K-12 level. Same with internationalizing the student body, although many schools and many districts have such cultural diversity that we have right there in the, school, in the school, the resources that could be used, could be activated to develop global competency. Think about, for example, uh, teaching foreign languages. Many schools are located in communities where there are heritage speakers of languages that it would be wonderful for all the students in the school to, to develop. Study abroad, very powerful, as I have argued, methodology. International service, engaging the kids in actually uh, solving or serving some, uh, some purpose, uh, some global purpose. Technology, using technology and distance learning, as IEARN does uh, successfully, uh, and other organizations. And then, of course, 
looking at expanding the time to internationalize outside of the school day. So after school and summer programs. There's some of the things that a school or a district could do to expand the opportunity for global education. Now, I've argued it's very important to pay attention to process. And I think uh, if, if the goal is to produce comprehensive internationalization, broad, deep, and integrative, then that is going to require leadership. There is no way around it. Strategy and sustained, sustained effort. Uh, that strategy is going to have to help clarify the goals. It would be useful to do some kind of an audit. Where are we now? Uh, craft a strategy, and then identify the champions, identify the bright spots in the school or in the district uh, which can inspire and on which the whole school can, can build. Uh, in some schools, it's going to be important to make the case. And I think that this is uh, not hard to make, but I just want to take a few moments suggesting what are some of the ideas that uh, any leader could use in making the case to parents, to district leaders, uh, to other important stakeholders. First of all, as I've argued, globalization is accelerating exponentially, and young people need to understand it, and need to understand how this process is influencing their lives. Uh, it is placing an economic premium in global skills. And it redefines citizenship. The boundaries between domestic and foreign policy issues are increasingly uh, interconnected, increasingly porous. The evidence that we have is that our schools and universities are not doing a very good job developing global competency. I think we, we may be already at a point where global competency is a very important equity divide. When you look at who participates in study abroad programs in colleges and universities, there is an underrepresentation of minority kids. And I think this is a problem we're going to have to solve because we do know that many employers in the new economy, the 21st century economy, look for the skills, look for global skills, for familiarity and interest with uh, uh, topics that are global, the ability to work in global teams the ability, the openness to travel, to relocate, and so on. So how do I define global competency? I suggested earlier that one of the constraints in many schools is the lack of a coherent, of an agreed upon definition of what uh, global competency is. And so I think a, a first step then is to try to generate some consensus on what global competency is at the school level. And I want to suggest that global competency has three components. The first component is attitudinal. It's a positive disposition to, uh, towards cultural difference. Uh, it's a curiosity uh, about different uh, civilizations and cultures and the ability to see those differences as opportunities. It's the opposite of uh, being threatened, of hunkering down when you encounter cultural difference. Second one, of course, is the ability to speak at advanced levels foreign languages. I think that this is so synergistic with the dispositional uh, element. And lastly, deep knowledge and understanding of disciplines that can help us understand globalization and the topics that are global in nature. And of course, they include world history and geography, but they also include other disciplines, such as public health, uh, climate, uh, economics, uh, history, and, and so on. So the first uh, set of competencies belong in the soft competences, which I argued earlier, are so, so very important in the 21st century at a time when everyone is going to have to reinvent themselves multiple times throughout their lives and careers, and uh, through when much, much of our work, much of what we will accomplish, we will accomplish working with other people. Second set of competencies are more traditional knowledge, but especially the ability to act on what we know to solve new problems. And the third, of course, are uh, foreign language skills. Uh, there are a number of uh, definitions out there of what cross-cultural competency means. These are uh, just some of the components of, of cross-cultural competency. And for anyone leading a process at a school or district level to try to develop that coherent vision of what globalization is and to develop a strategy, it would be useful to get to the level of outlining, uh, specifying 
what are the kinds of competencies that we want our students to, to have, to master. Same for foreign language skills, same for knowledge about global affairs. Which global affairs uh, what we need by, by knowledge. And of course, once we have clarity about the end goal, it's a lot easier to define the curriculum and the instructional process that would help people uh, produce that. So these are some components of the knowledge that is helpful to understand globalization. These are some of the examples of attitudes. And these are some of the examples of the skills. Uh, I want to conclude mentioning that uh, actually taking on this task is a lot easier than, than it may seem. Uh, that while it may be different to what most schools have done, it is within the reach, I believe, certainly of any district or any partnership between a number of schools and an NGO. I've had the pleasure over the last uh, year and a half to be working with a team of colleagues developing a global studies curriculum for an innovative uh, a network of global schools that will open in New York City next year, the Avenue Schools. And if you're curious to learn more about that curriculum, I don't have time right now to talk about it, but you can, as I mentioned, Google my name, get to my website, and you will find references to that curriculum and a couple of lectures that present it. So I'd like to leave the remaining 20 minutes for questions and answers and for your own thoughts on how do we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. This is Steve Hargadon, and I will help moderate the Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. If you've posted a question previously and we've missed it, which is uh, likely, please feel free to post it again. Or you can use the uh, raise hand icon, and we'll give you the microphone. So to raise your hand, you click on the third icon over in the participant window. So Professor, I don't know if you can see, but Ralph asked the question, is there a need for a global curriculum? I think so. I think so. Uh, I do think that uh, there is a need for a global curriculum, which can take uh, one of two forms, right? It could be a, a curriculum that infuses throughout the existing established subjects in your particular school or district the opportunity to develop a global competency, or it could be, as in the case of avenues, a curriculum that devotes dedicated time uh, every week uh, throughout a sustained period for avenues is throughout uh, 10 or 11 years of the school trajectories of kids, the opportunity to develop those competencies. So, so yes, I, I've tried to argue this morning that global competency uh, is not going to happen unless we are very deliberate about the competencies we want to achieve and mapping out the scope and the sequence that will provide the students the opportunities to develop those skills. Lily asks, would it be possible to have the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, Professor, if you're comfortable with it, they can click on File, Save, and they can save the whiteboard from today's session, uh, and they can save it in a PDF form. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. Sure, that's, fi that's fine with me. Thank you, Steve. And then Ralph saying, aren't we all learning the same things anyway? I don't think that's necessarily a question, but it's a follow-up there. So if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. That's the third icon over, and we'll give you the microphone, or you can put a question in the chat. Professor, where are you from originally? Uh, I was born and raised in the country of Venezuela, and I came to the United States 28 years ago. And I have a terrible cold today, so what you hear is a combination of my Spanish accent, which is my native language, uh, plus a cold. So I participated in a, an exchange program as a high school student out of three year in Brazil. Are you aware of any exchange programs that do focus uh, predominantly on lower income students? There are exchange programs uh, supported by foundations in different places that focus on the lower income students indeed. And, uh, uh, to give you an example, the, the Department of Defense has the program because they are so aware of the, of the equity gap around the opportunity to develop global competency designed to promote foreign language instruction in, uh, in districts in inner cities. So, so there are such programs indeed. Seeing a note in the chat from Carol, and, or from Carol saying Americans promoting study abroad. Um, she also asks, what would you see as the best way to influence national curriculum standards? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can, can uh, you clarify? Um, I can't clarify, but if uh, Carol would like to, Carol, you're welcome to raise your hand and I'll give you the microphone. Um, while we're waiting for Carol, it looks like Ralph has raised his hand and I'm going to give him the microphone. Ralph, to turn your microphone on, you click on the talk button at the top left of your screen. Yes, hello. Um, a very, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just um, a little bit questioned by um, the, the whole global uh, curriculum uh, point because I think the value and the role of teachers is somehow underestimated in um, this whole area because um, we all live now in a global environment and it's part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, the classrooms become more international because there's more foreign students uh, in classrooms. Um, you know, uh, when you go in the supermarket, you see more and more foreign people around you. Um, it's becoming a part of our life, just like internet is becoming a part of our life. And um, but in the end, I think we still all need to learn the same things. And I think the beauty of of internationalization is just adding a dimension into classrooms whereby if you're, for instance, teaching something about history and you're looking at world leaders from your history point of view, um, the value is then in, hey, what would be a teacher at the other end of the world teaching about world leaders and what's their point of view? And I think it's just trying to kind of give teachers the opportunity to understand, well, hey, actually the value in using technology is not about using technology or the value of a global education, not really uh, the global education, but the value is that I, as a teacher, can now teach my subjects more interesting because I can, I can bring in other dimensions into my classroom that actually make my teaching more interesting because I can teach with other teachers around the world and my students can see other points of view from other points in the world and bring those into the classroom. Um, I'm not sure if I'm bringing my point really over, but I, I think it's just something that's happening, but it needs to be somehow be made accessible and, 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 and more visible to, 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 to teachers what, what really the benefits are there for them more than right. for, well, they're, all there, they're also there for the students, yeah. but it's actually to the benefit of I, the teacher. It can make their teaching so much more exciting. Yes, Ralph, I think you're yes, making uh, at least three points. Uh, the first one, of course, that getting teachers to collaborate with peers in other parts of the world using technology and to get their students to collaborate can be a very powerful way to develop global competency, both of teachers and students. I absolutely agree with you. The question that if teachers were to teach their regular subjects in this way, that would be a sufficient, uh, a sufficient approach to develop global competency, I disagree. Because it seems to me that in order to prepare people to understand globalization, there are certain things that we need to study, things which are not studied uh, in, uh, in many schools. For example, I think it's important for a high school graduate to have the fundamentals of demography, to understand the science of demography, to understand how populations change. Very difficult to comprehend our world if you don't understand that. I think that it's important to have a minimum understanding of uh, contemporary uh, sort of main foreign relations uh, issues, global issues. For example, I'd say that a high school graduate would need to have the skills and the motivation to understand the Arab Spring and uh, what brought it about, what are the likely consequences, and so on. And if you just uh, uh, provide the means for teachers to teach their subjects uh, in collaboration with their peers, they may or may not on their own provide space in the curriculum, or they may or may not have the opportunity to provide space in the curriculum to expose their students to a phenomenon of huge global consequences, such as the Arab Spring, for example, or to get them to understand demography or understand them public health and so on. I think I uh, partly agree with you and, and also uh, disagree with you uh, as a matter of emphasis, as a matter of the need to have uh, a global curriculum.
question, Lily? Do you have a follow-up question, or is it uh, who's next? I'm taking over for Steve here. Uh, Lily, I'm going to give you the mic, and you can ask your question. Press talk. Okay. Do we have another person who's ready to give a question? I, I'm sorry. Here. Your mic? Okay. Let me turn it back on for you. You've got to click on it pretty quick. It's working. Why don't you type your question, Lily, really, and I'll, I'll pass, pass it on. It on. Sure. While Lily is working out um, her question, um, what can we do? You know, I think it's really essential, um, Fernando, that, that school leaders get this message. What can we do? Um, how can we get superintendents to make global education more of a priority? Um, because I really think it starts with them. Any thoughts on that? Well, so, some superintendents are, of course, already on board. Uh, but it seems to me that any person who is interested in promoting global competency can uh, start to build a coalition at the school level, among schools, with parents, with community organizations, with the local World Affairs Council, and uh, with the local community organizations, whether it's your Lions Club or, or the Rotaries or something of that sort, and just begin a conversation about uh, uh, you know, what, what is globalization? Uh, what are these opportunities? I mean, talk about something so concrete and so simple as the X Prize, or get a hold of this report, which I mentioned here, and uh, share with them. You know, this is a, a report uh, produced by the Committee of the, for Economic Development uh, five years ago on global education. And then, you know, invite in your local library a group of uh, members of the community who are leaders, perhaps the members of the school committee, uh, perhaps a superintendent, perhaps some teachers, and say, why don't we read and discuss reports like this one? There are no numerous, but this is a particularly good one. And then say, what are the implications of these findings for our schools? Are we serving our children the way we would like to serve them? And I think that's one of the ways. My sense is that most superintendents are very attentive to their school committees, to the town leadership, and to, and to members of the community, and to their school principals and teachers as well. Question. From, from an on-the-ground and practical pers perspective, what professional development topics should teachers study in order to be best prepared to implement a global curriculum? What competencies should we ideally have as teachers? So I think you have to tie these with the either school or district plan. I've, I've tried to make the case that uh, there is no uh, single approach that all schools in the world should follow to develop global competency, but that instead a sensible approach should begin where every particular school is and should chart a trajectory that takes that school from where they are to where they or their district wants to be. And so. I can imagine, say, a district approach where leaders in different schools uh, agreed on a set of outcomes that define global competency, perhaps drawing on some of the suggestions that I have offered this morning, uh, and then identified what are the bright spots in those districts. Now, in that particular district, perhaps they have a wonderful program of study abroad. But maybe it's a program that hasn't yet developed very good academic connections. Suppose that this is a district that has an exchange with China. And every year, they take a number of students to China, and some students come from China. And, uh, but there are questions as to uh, whether they are making the best possible use of the opportunities to develop connections with academics in the school. So, I'd say that journey would be about maximizing, scaling up what they have, uh, drawing the maximum benefit. And that would have implications for PD. So for example, suppose that in that particular school, they decided that uh, they want to begin to look at, uh, and I don't know, some policy issues in, in China, and perhaps even some controversial uh, issues in China. Uh, I don't know, industrialization, uh, energy plants, and so on. So you could then identify what is it that teachers need to know to lead good discussions of some of those controversial issues. And you can identify where are the opportunities for them to get that knowledge. So 
I, as you realize, I, I am avoiding to give a blanket recipe that all teachers should follow because I think the best professional development, the best teacher professional development is really uh, aligned with a, a school program of improvement, with a school project of institutional improvement. And I think that is the first order of business. If we're going to move from the individual efforts that we now have, where global education is the work of champions, of le individual leaders, into a phase where I hope that global education is actually the work of teams, of collectives, at a school level and at a district level. conclusion to our session today. Um, we have about four minutes until our next session, our next keynote starts, uh, Professor, so I want to make sure that we give everybody enough time to get to the next room. There are so many fabulous questions in the chat, um, and I don't know how we would need about three hours, I think, to answer them all. Um, what I suggest uh, to people who still have unanswered questions, um, Perhaps you want to write in the discussion forum of the Global Education Collaborative, globaleducationconference.com, start a discussion post from some, you know, listing some of the ideas and questions that you have from this session, and perhaps we can all chime in and answer them for each other, and I can send the link to Dr. Reimers afterwards. Um, we really appreciate your time. This has been fabulous. This is a really, really great talk. Um, also, I think in the discussion in chat, there's been a lot of good um, discussion as well. And I believe you can save the chat, if you'd like to, under uh, File, Save, Chat. And I'm going to save it for, for me right now, actually, because I'm very interested in going back and looking at the side conversation that was going on during this. This session um, will be archived, so you can go back and look through all the resources that have been listed. Um, it'll take about a half an hour after we've all left the room in order for it to be processed. So um, this will be online for posterity, for, and hopefully you can use it in your own professional development later on um, past the conference. Thank you again, Professor, and we really appreciate your time and expertise. It's been a, a, a treasure. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy, and thank you, Steve, and thank you all of you for coming. I appreciate your interest in, uh, in global education, and I really commend you, Lucy and Steve, and your sponsors for modeling for us what technology makes possible in terms of developing very innovative ways uh, to organize professional development around topics that are uh, very timely, uh, very pertinent, and also in a global way. So thank you all very much. It's been a privilege. Um, Sasha Martin is the next keynoter. Uh, she's uh, has a she's been cooking her way around the world, basically for her family. And I think you'll find her session very interesting. I'll try and find the link and post it in the chat. Uh, but I'm going to stop the recording now, and everybody needs to vacate the room so the recording processing can happen. Um, so anyway, thanks again for everything, everybody. You're fabulous. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye bye.